Wow. When you think about it, that's the greatest lyrics we could sing because when we have him, we have all of his blessings. We have everything that we could ever need. And when we seek his blessings and we miss him, we've missed the greatest thing of all. Amen. So that was really challenging. I like that. All right. You got your Bibles ready to, to get into these promises a little more. The guaranteed, guaranteed by God. Hallelujah. You'll know that this series rose out of my, in my life of a time this summer when it seemed like everything was falling apart and there had been a thievery here at the church and just, it just was shocking. It felt such betrayal and hurt and confusion. And it, it was just a real time that I needed to get a hold of God. And the way I know to get a hold of God is to get into his word. And the Lord just showed me some wonderful promises that mean so much to me. And I'm sharing with you what have sustained me in the times when, well, when it just is tough. How many of you know there are tough times in this life that we all go through? And in those times, you need something to hang on to. And God has given us these wonderful promises. Second Peter, go ahead and stand if you will. Second Peter uh, chapter 1 in the fourth verse is the key scripture that we have used. It says, we have been given... It has been given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises. Say those words real loud with me. Exceedingly great and precious promises. I love that. That through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. These are great, exceedingly great and precious, valuable, like precious stones precious promises. And Hebrews chapter 6 is the text that we're going to look today. This is the second part of promise number one that we're looking at this morning. Are you glad to be in church today? I'm so glad that you're here. Dax and Erica, is it y'all's uh, anniversary? Well, that picture that I saw on Facebook looked so fancy and you just looked like you'd just gotten married again. I thought it was, I was going to wish you a happy anniversary. Y'all had been somewhere fancy. We'll celebrate that you're still married. That's what it's about. Amen. And I performed that. I tied that knot real good. I just, I just believe God's got great things for you all. So I just speak blessings and grace all over you. And I saw that today and I thought it was your anniversary. I was going to wish you one, but it's all right. Everybody got Hebrews chapter six. I just want to pray over the, that particular word, and then we're going to go through it verse by verse uh, as I teach it. So I'm not going to read it all right now, but that will be the text of the morning. There's somebody here this morning that really needs to hear this word one more time, that God said he'd never leave you and he'd never forsake you. Sometimes we don't feel God, but he promised that he would always be there, and he's not a liar. He's always going to be by your side. We're going to talk about some of the th times when he feels distance, distant, even though he isn't. And we'll understand why that happens sometimes. But are you ready to pray over the word? And let's receive what we have from God today. Lord, we thank you for this word that guides us, lights the way, teaches us, feeds us, sustains us, builds us up, and doesn't tear us down. Thank you for it, God. I pray that it would feed our souls, feed my soul, God, with it, feed all of our soul. And as one brother said, I've been feeding on last week's sermon all week long, that you're right beside me in the morning, in the noon, at nighttime, in the good times and the bad times. The others will walk out, but God, you never will leave us. And we sure thank you for that, Lord. Help us know these promises are true. They're always true. Never out of season. You've told us these things will last forever. Help us to cling to them as an assurance in the times particularly that try our faith and try to tear us down. We look up. We don't look down. We look to you, Yahweh. Our hope is in you. And thank you that you gave us these promises to hold on to when it seems like sometimes everything else is falling apart. You're a good God. And we trust you now more than we ever have. Because you've proven yourself to us over and over and over again. Even when we're not faithful, you're still faithful. Oh, thank you for that, God. We don't deserve you. That's why we call it amazing grace. 
thank you for your mercy today. Touch us all in Jesus' name. Everybody said, love you so much. You may be seated. Now, we're going to have a lot of scripture today. I, I'm a teacher of the word, and I get excited, and I like to shout and have a good time, but I, I like to shout over substance and not just feeling. Amen? So, make sure that you have your Bible or at least something to jot some of these things down. The, this series has been so impactful for me that I believe it can be for you as well. In the book of Hebrews chapter 6, the passage that I'd asked you to turn to, we see a long-term view of the pro power of the promises of God that are guaranteed. The long-term view. And it talks about how it sometimes takes a while for these promises to manifest. And once we believe the promise, and between the time that we believe it and receive it, we're walking by faith. Amen? That's what we've been learning. And to grasp some of these things, I'm going to be giving you throughout the series what I'm calling the theology of promises. Some things that theologically and biblically we need to understand about God's promises. Number one, last week we talked about it, and that is that God is a promiser by, his, by nature. It's just His nature to make promises. And He tells us that we are heirs of His promises. We have inherited all the promises. And again, Randall beautifully prayed it this morning that all of the promises of God are yes. That's his answer. Yes, it's for you too. And amen. So be it. And that's Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians that tells us that. And so that's a beautiful thing. We're heirs of promise. And I think of that, your identity and my identity is wrapped up and tied up in the promises of God. We are heirs. That's who we are, heirs of the promises. I'm a child of God, but a part of that, my identity is I have things that I've inherited because I've been linked in to the promises of God. If you're glad for that, say amen. Hallelujah. The Christian life is about his promises and our faith as to what we believe that he said he will do what he said he would do. That's Christianity. We must practice our faith in the promises of God. You and I make promises with the best of our intentions, don't we? I promise I'm going to be there, but guess what? Sometimes things happen and you don't always keep your promise. Oh, I'm going to be there, Pastor. How many people tell me they're going to be somewhere and they never show up? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. That basically means I want to. <laughs> I intend to. I mean well. I'll try. Come on, y'all. Don't shout me down. That's what we mean. We say, I, I promise. We're going to do our best that we can do it. But how many of you know that's not what God's saying? God's not saying, I'm going to try to do this for you. Aren't you glad that God says, I can do it and I will do it because my word is always true. Hallelujah. So the first thing is God's a promiser by nature. And the second thing that I want to bring to your attention today is God keeps his promises. Can somebody say praise the Lord for that? You know, you, we take out, how many of you have ever taken out a loan? Five of you? If you got all that money, you're paying cash, you need to give more. I said, how many of you have ever taken out a loan, a car, a mortgage? Come on. I'm not going to ask you the next question. Keep your hands lowered, but sometimes folks don't always make it to be able to keep good with those loans. Maybe some of us in here have not been able to do that. There's a situation. We say, when we take a loan out, we say, we promise we're going to pay this thing. We're going to pay it off. But how many of you know some folks don't keep their promise? Situations happen in life, and they're not able to do that. How many of you know that the bank even tries to insure the loan? But we've learned in the United States of America that even our financial institutions that seem so strong and so powerful sometimes are not even able to keep their promise to do what they said that they were able to do. Aren't you glad God is not like that? God is not dependent on circumstances. God is not dependent on things around him. God is not like that. His character and his word never change. Amen? Never change. So let's look in our text this morning, Hebrews chapter 6. It's a little lengthy, but I'd like us to begin reading in verse 11, and it will be on your screen if you haven't got a Bible with you. It says, We desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope 
until the end. In other words, keep believing what God said until you see that promise manifested. And he says that you do not become sluggish or slow in your faith, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. How do we inherit the promises, does it say here in verse 12? Faith and patience. Through faith and patience, I believe the promise, and I'm going to receive the promise, but I'm going to have to have faith and walk by faith and have some patience until it is manifested. Amen? And we, these, these are all told to us that we will not become sluggish. How many of you have ever gotten sluggish in your faith before? Me too. Maybe you're in a situation now and you feel sluggish and slow and you need a jump start. Or maybe you're coming out of a season of that. He, he wants us to be imitators of others who have through faith and through patience obtained the promise. I don't want to just hear the promise. I want to receive the promise. How about you? Now, before we go on, we need to get the context about the promises that chapter 6 here in Hebrews is talking about in our text, okay? So let's just get the idea here for just a second. Go on and let's look in the 13th verse for just a second. It says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Now that's interesting. You see, the Bible contains two kinds of promises. Another word used for promises in the Scripture is covenant covenants that God makes. And there's two kinds of promises or covenants in the Bible. You do want to learn some things about the Bible. You don't do, amen? Let's talk about it a second. First of all, there's a conditional covenant that God makes that the Bible says. Now, in a conditional covenant, God has a part in the covenant and you have a part in the covenant, okay? I do my part and God does his part. The Mosaic covenant, the covenant that was given to Moses was one of those conditional ones. God did his part, and then he was to do his part. Moses was in teaching the people and them practicing it. All the way through Exodus chapters 19 through 24 is the Mosaic covenant, and that's an example of the conditional one. You know this. I will bless you if you obey me. We like to quote those scriptures, but those were for the people that were conditional. If you obey me, you will be blessed. If you don't obey me, there's consequences for that. But it was all con conditional. God says, I'll do this if you do that. And that is a conditional covenant. However, there is, and this is what I'm preaching on the promises that I've chosen to share with you, are what we call unconditional covenants or unconditional promise, promises. And these particular promises which I'm giving you involve only God. They don't really involve us except that we are to believe them and receive them. But as far as making the promise, I don't have a part in the promise. All I have to do is believe them and receive them, okay? God carries the weight of both parties in that kind of a covenant. God says, I'm going to make good on this promise on my character alone. You don't basically have to do anything. The Abrahamic covenant was like that. It was different than the Moses covenant. In Genesis 12, God says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And when you really study that, you'll find that Abraham was a, a, a person that believed in many gods at that particular time. And he says, I am the God. I am the God, the true one true living God. And he taught him as he spoke to him along the way. It wasn't up to Abraham except to believe it, but it, the covenant was going to happen whether he did or not. I choose you. How many of you know if God says, I choose you, that's God saying that. You don't have to do anything about it. God says, I do it. All right? You can cooperate with it, or you can make it a long, long, twisted, turning situation. But if God says this is what you're going to do, that's what you're going to do. God has made a promise. This will come to pass. And that's the kind of covenant that it was with Abraham. God chose the people that would be his people, the children of the nation of Israel. And the father of that nation, he chose. It wasn't up to them to vote it or figure it out. God chose it, and it was going to be Abraham that was that father, okay? So that was an unconditional covenant or promise. Now, the word covenant means to make a cut, now, I want you to just to get a little bit of the background of what Hebrews 6 is talking about. In the Old Testament, 
If two parties were involved in the covenant, a conditional covenant, they had a ceremony when they made covenant with one another. They took a sacrificial animal, they killed it, they cut it in half. They cut it down the middle the long way, not ha across the side, but the long way. They would cut that animal into two halves. And the two that were involved in the covenant would stand between the halves and they would shake hands and they would make covenant one to another. They would swear to whatever they were committing to do. It was a ceremony. Now, in our portion of scripture here, when God made an unconditional covenant, it was different than what I just explained to you that was a, a conditional covenant. When God made an unconditional covenant, he went through the whole ceremony, but he went through it by himself, okay? He didn't have anybody else that had any say about it. God says, this I will do. This is something you can mark down. It is true now. It'll be true tomorrow, and it'll be true years from now. It's always true if it's that kind of a covenant. And one of those things we're studying now is I will never leave you nor forsake you. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what others say is going on. I don't care what it feels like. I'm telling you, I will never walk out on you. You can write it down. That's my word. No matter what you're going through, I'm right there with you. In fact, the minute somebody else decides they're walking out, God says, all right, I'm going to snuggle up even a little closer to them. That's what God's saying to us. It is an unconditional covenant that he's made with us. Now, it's interesting here. God's saying that he's going to fulfill the commitment no matter what Abraham did. In fact, if you look in the Word of God, this is back in Genesis chapter 15, and I think it's in the 12th verse, God actually put Abraham to sleep when he began to make this covenant. He didn't want him messing up. He didn't want him arguing. He put him to sleep in that 12th verse, okay? And it says that. And then if you'll look in the 17th and the 18th verse, um, it's talking about what is, this is after he'd made the covenant. It says this, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces of the animal. On the same day, the Lord had made the covenant with Abraham saying to your descendants, I have given this land. Abram, I've chosen you, that my chosen people on this earth is going to be your people, okay? And he describes it from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, okay? So that's what Hebrews 6 is talking about when we read here in verse uh, number 13 that God made a promise to Abraham, Hebrews 6, 13, because he could swear by no one greater. It was his covenant and promise alone, and there was nobody greater he could swear to or swear by, so he decided, I'm going to swear by myself, okay? I'm going to keep this covenant, and I'm going to keep this promise, okay? That's what he's talking all about. And what was the promise? Verse 14 saying, surely blessing, I will bless you, Abraham, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And aren't you glad God doesn't forget? I don't know about you, but I even forget sometimes that I've done things with people. People come up and say, Pastor Dave, do you remember the time back in, in so-and-so, and we did this, and I, I go, no, I don't remember that. Well, you were right there with me. And you know, the older I get, the fewer things I remember. I told you last week, I go into a room, and I can't remember what I went in there for. And now people tell me things we've done, and maybe later I'll get it. Come on now, don't look so holy at me there. You know we have things like that as we get past the age of 25. Are y'all with me? It happens to us. And I can't remember. We went golfing or we did this or we did that. And I don't always remember that. But aren't you glad that God doesn't forget anything? He doesn't forget that he made those promises to him, okay? So he says, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. I will bless you and multiply your descendants. That is an unconditional promise. Verse 15, and so after he had patiently endured, and you know the story of Abraham and Sarah and how it didn't look like it was going to come to pass and all the stuff, that, that was patience. Faith, yes, but also patience. You can't have faith if you don't have patience, amen? He patiently endured 
and then he obtained the promise. For men, verse 16, indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Verse 17, thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. Who are the heirs of promise? You say, I am. I'm, I'm an heir of the promise, okay? That promise is for me. And he wants to show you more and more and more and more, you that are the heirs of promise, abundantly. He wants to show you a whole lot, his word and his promise, okay? The immutability of his counsel, that means it's an unchanging counsel, it's an unchanging promise, Con and he confirmed it by an oath. Verse 18, and this was the oath that by two immutable or unchanging things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation or assurance. I'm preaching this because I want you to have the assurance that you're not by yourself and there's no, nothing and nothing and nobody, anybody can do to you and nothing can happen to you that God's not, is not right there beside you. And not only is he beside you, he's not just watching you get beaten up. He says, if God, if I'm for you, this, this situation really cannot be against you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Whoa, did I need to hear that when it looked like everything was falling apart a few months ago? If I'm for you, nothing can be again. No situation is so bad that you are defeated. Rise up and act like an heir of the promise. You're rich in the things of God. Come on, somebody. You're rich. You're an heir. There's promises that are for you. Rise up and act like those promises are for you. Amen. Hallelujah. So he guaranteed his promise with two unchangeable things, immutable things. And those two things, by the way, was number one, his character. He cannot lie. And number two, his word. His character and his word never change. God is always God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Matthew 24 and verse 35. Amen? People may forget the things they did or said. God is nothing like that. He never forgets. His love never fails. It never gives up. It never walks out on you. Come on now. In fact, he included you and me in the promises of Abraham. Look at Galatians 3 and 29 just real quickly. What God promised Abraham is what God also promised you and me because it says if you are Christ, how many of you belong to Christ? Christ is in you and you are in him. Come on, lift up your hand. Are you ashamed of Jesus? Come on today. Amen. I belong to Christ. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed or his offspring and you are heirs according to the promise. And if God said, I'll bless you, Abraham, God said, I'll bless you, Anisha. I'll bless you, Helen. I'll bless you, Sandy. If God said that to Abraham, God said that to you, and God said that to me. So I got to quit hanging my head down. I just need to get in the book and realize I'm blessed. And the hand of God is upon my life. Whew. That is long-term promise keeping. Can you say amen to that? Long-term promise keeping. Now, Satan will tell you other things, but the Bible says in John chapter 8 and 44 that not only is he a liar, he's the father of the lies. And the opposite of a liar is a truth teller. Satan is the opposite of God. God always tell the truth because he cannot lie. I don't think Satan can tell the truth. And if he does, it's to deceive you and warp it and twist it a little bit to make it sound like something it really isn't. Come on now. So that's who we've got here, Satan and God in this situation. But I, I love the scripture in Joshua chapter 23, verse 14. We studied this on a Wednesday night one time. And this was right before the children of Israel were serving all these other gods. And, you know, finally Joshua got to the place where he says, look, he, he was getting ready to just say, look, I'm, I'm making a decision here. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You know that one. We're, we're making a decision. We're going to serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. We're not going to put up with these other gods. We're serving God, the Lord, the one true living God. He's our God. Now, you're going to have to make up your mind. And he gave them this scripture. Well, this scripture, he said it. We're reading the scripture about what he said. And this is what he said in Joshua 23, 14. He says, guys, before you make your decision about which God you're going to serve, just remember, not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. 
all, everybody say all, all have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. Then he says, after he tells them, come on, did he not tell you he'd take you out of Egypt? Did he not tell you that he'd feed you, that he'd clothe you, that he'd protect you from the enemies, that he'd send a pillar of cloud by night and fire by day? Come on, did he not tell you those things? Not one word of what he spoke has he not fulfilled in your life. And then he says, now, make your choice. If, you, if God is not God, serve the other gods. But think of what he's done. Think of what he's done for you and where he's brought you. As for me and my house, we've made up our minds. We're going to serve the Lord, he said. Amen? How many of you have made up your mind? I've been through this thing enough. I've been through enough tough times to know that God has fulfilled every word. He never has left me. I might not have known where he was and what he was doing, but he was there when I look back on it. And he's never left me, and he's never forsaken me one time. Not one word of his promises has ever failed. Ooh, I like that, don't you? Take a deep breath when you read that. That's our God. God has nothing to do with broken promises. Nothing. When he says, I promise, mark it down. It's true. No, so number one, God's a promiser by nature. Number two, God keeps his promises. Amen? Now, back to the second part of our first unconditional promise, which is God is always with me. Boy, that's, I, I, I'm going to give you a lot of them, but this is one of my favorite ones. God is always with me. And I want you to look in Hebrews 13 for just a moment. Verse 5 and 6. If you don't like Scripture, you ain't going to like this message. This is filled with Scripture. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, this is what God says, I will never, read it with me, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Say that again. Come on, everybody, read it loud. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, because of that, it says, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, that's the message for somebody in this house right this morning. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what situation you're in. The Lord is my helper. Maybe I don't deserve it. Maybe I'm reaping what I've sown. I know that. But he's a helper to get you out of the harvest and get you into another harvest. He is my helper. I will not fear. Because God is always with me. Say, I will not fear. You've got to hit that down. I will not fear. And for every promise we get, and we're going to talk about, there's something that we can do that we couldn't do before because we believe the promise. God is always with me. I believe that. Therefore, I will not fear. Amen? I will not fear. What is it that man can do unto me? What can man do to me? That's a word for somebody today. You think somebody, you're scared of somebody. If God is for you, what can man do to you? Now, you might go through a little trouble, but you're going to come out. God, part of our inheritance is that God will turn the negatives into good in the end. Read your Bible. Get in church and hear the messages. There's no need to stay home and hang your head when you got the Word of God and you are an heir of the promise. Whew, come on. Tough times, I know that. But we got a tougher God that will take care of us in the midst of these tough times. Amen? Now, you might be thinking, I'm preaching this stuff, but you might be thinking, because I think like this when I'm down. I think, well, I believe that promise too. But pastor, honestly, God's with everyone. God's with everyone. So, okay, he's with me, but he's with everyone. So what's the big deal of shouting and saying, hallelujah, I'm encouraged? He's with everybody. It's just another preacher trick to try to make me feel good and give a big offering. Come on, that's, come on people think that way, don't they? And I, I want to talk to you about that for just a moment because, yes, God is with everyone. That's called the omnipresence of God. How many of you know God is everywhere? He's everywhere. 
God's with the heathen. God's with the ungodly. God's with the sinner man. God's with the, the lepers and the prostitutes and everybody that does anything you can imagine. God's with all of us because he is omnipresent. He's everywhere. David said, though I make my bed in hell, I can't get away from you. I look up in the midst of all that and there you are. <laughs> You, can't, you can run, but you can't hide. God is everywhere. So there is truth. Isn't he everywhere? What's the big? Yeah, he is everywhere. He is with everybody in that sense, in the omnipresence of God. So you, just, you can read those scriptures, uh, Psalm 139, 7 through 10, and Jeremiah 23, 23 through 24. Those, those are scriptures that remind us that God's everywhere. But there's also, besides the omnipresence of God, there's what we call the manifest presence of God. The Bible says, if two or more gather in my name, there I am in the midst. That means if there's only one, he's not there. No, he's there too. But there's something special when two or more gather together. How many of you feel something a little different than sometimes you do in your bedroom or your kitchen table when we're worshiping together? And there is a manifestation of the presence and the glory of God that comes when we all gather together and worship together and submit ourselves to God together. That's the manifestation of the presence of God. And that's why he says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You need, you don't just need to be in the omnipresence. You need the manifest presence. But then there's even another presence called the inner presence of God. We're going to call it that. It's that personal presence of God. And you especially need to know that that inner presence is there because the Bible says God is my refuge and God is my strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. And that's why I always say God will show up when everybody else walks out. And there is an inner presence where you sense God curling up at night when you're crying. He'll curl up in bed with you, put his arm around you, and let you cry on his shoulder when nobody else has time for you anymore and you're all alone. That's the kind of God that we serve. That inner presence, personal presence of God where he's close up and personal. Now, you might be thinking, and again, I think like this, so that's why I preach like this. You might be thinking, okay, well, what about the times I don't sense him? And how many of you lift your hands and say, there are times I don't sense him close? Come on. What happens then? Has he left me? No. Because first of all, he promised he'd never leave you. It doesn't matter what you feel. I've looked back and thought God was nowhere in sight. But as I've looked back on the situation, oh boy, was he ever there? Was he ever doing stuff? I couldn't feel him. I couldn't see him. I couldn't even begin to declare that he was near there. But when I look back, hindsight is wisdom, isn't it? You can see, was God ever there? My God was there. And he was working the whole situation out. Okay? But he, he, so he said he'd never leave us. I will say this, he'll never leave you, but you might leave him. He's there with you and for you all the time. Even when you mess up, he's not leaving you. Even when you blow it, he's not leaving you. He's there. He's right by you. But why don't I always sense him? Why don't I always feel him? Well, somebody said one time, if God seems far off, guess who moved? It wasn't God. God's right there. But let's see if Scripture might address a few of these things because this is the way I think. I don't want just a pat answer. I've got, I've got questions about pat answers sometimes. And if we study, the Bible gives us some good answers to them. So let's look at them for just a second. A few things when we don't feel God, but yet, pastor, you're telling me he's always with me. I'm telling you that on the basis of God's character because he never lies and the fact that his word is always true. Okay. So what about when I don't feel his presence? Well, the scriptures talk to us that God seems far away. He's there. But he backs off or he allows you to walk away from him. Not that he's not right there. And, and if you need him, boom, he's going to be there. But there are moments that he will just back off or let you run off to learn a lesson. And once you've learned the lesson, he's there ready to help you in your time of need. But he's a gentleman and he won't force himself on you and make you do anything you're not willing to do. He said, you'll seek me. And you'll find me when you search for me, not haphazardly, not while I'm watching TV, I might check out a script. No, with all your heart. So sometimes he'll let us get in situations 
when we got to do it with all our heart. And if you're a kind of a person that you just kind of in and out and flipping, and flopping, and it's not a big deal, God is always with you, but he'll be quiet sometimes. And he will seem he's not there because if you, well, let me just tell you, let me just give you the points and quit talking. I mean, talk my notes and not just talk because I can talk. Here we go. God seems far away to the proud. When we're proud, what does it mean to be proud? To be proud simply says, I can do this by myself. I can handle it, God. And he seems far away. He's there, but he seems far away when we are proud. Psalm 138 and verse 6 says this, Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards, he gives special attention, and he gets real close to the lowly, the humble. Those that say and sing that song from their heart, not just the words, I need you, I need you, I'm a wretch undone without you. Tears come in my eyes when I sing that song because I know it to be true. God, and I, guess what? When I did it, tears came to my eyes and they sensed his presence. Why? Because I was yielding myself. I wasn't proud to say, yeah, it's a good song for the weak. I'm a strong man of God. I don't need that. Guess what? God's still there, but I don't sense him very much because he does not manifest his presence to the proud. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He is there, but he doesn't like pride. God gives grace to the humble. And what does he do to the proud? He resists the proud. When we have the idea that we don't need God or that we don't really have time to pray, we don't have time for the Word, we don't have time to worship, that's for the weaker people and that's for the people that need a crutch to lean on. God backs off. He's there. He's always there. He said he'd never leave you. But he backs off and says, okay, try that for a while and see how long you on your own can make it. Are you with me? Wait a while and you'll be coming back to me. You'll be telling me you can't make it by yourself. Jesus himself says, without me, I don't care how strong you think you are, without me, you really ultimately can do nothing. And we have to learn that ultimately. I heard a preacher once on Larry King Live when he had his show, and he was being interviewed about spiritual things, and Larry was talking to him, and he says, isn't the whole idea, Pastor, of praying to God just a crutch? I mean, if I've got cancer, don't I have to pray to something? I mean, I, I need some kind of a crutch to lean on. Isn't that what prayer is all about? And the pastor's response, I remember, was very good. He said, thank God for that crutch, Larry. He said, God's not only a crutch to me, he's the whole hospital. <laughs> I like that. That's the idea. He's my everything. He's my, he's, he, he, he's my lab, lab partner. He, he, he takes me to surgery and cuts out things. I, I mean, he, he, he takes me to intensive care. I, he, God's my whole hospital. Aren't you glad for that? How many of you say that? He's not just a crutch. Come on. I, sometimes a crutch won't do. I limp along with a crutch. Sometimes I need, I, I need the surgery. Come on now. So he's the whole hospital. I like that. People that just think God is for weak people. No, God seems far away to the proud. Secondly, God seems far away to the worldly. Worldly? You mean those drug pushers and those prostitutes? No, I'm talking worldly. World-like people. People that live like the world lives. Now, how's that? Their priorities, even though they're Christians, is the same priorities of the world. Money, entertainment, they don't have time for God, they don't have to, you know, they, they believe they're Christians, they're getting to heaven as by fire. Come on, we, we, we preach that Wednesday night in Bible study. But they're really worldly. There's no difference in them and the world. Now, the... The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, so I'm not talking that this is sin and that's it because we used to call holiness, you can't play baseball, you can't play basketball, you can't, all that. I'm not talking about that stuff. But I'm saying we do everything with moderation because God is my refuge. That baseball game is not going to be there when I'm in trouble. That baseball game is not going to heal my body. God is the only one that can do those things for me. So I have to keep the balance of those things. And I'm worldly 
when I love the world as much or more than I love God. That's worldly. Enjoy the world, yes. Love it. Be passionate for it like you are God. No. Okay? James chapter 4 and verse number 4 says this. Adulterers, adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So if you are acting like you're an enemy of God when you're really a child of God, God, God doesn't leave you, but you sure don't sense his inner presence or his manifest presence very much in your life. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So that's times, the, there's moments we just don't sense God. Our hearts can be wrong. And how many know we all live in this battle? Come on, we're in the world, even though we're not of it. And it's hard sometimes to get our priorities right. Come on, this isn't a condemning message. This is just a, a truth-telling message to help me understand sometimes that we just get our attention and focus on other things instead of God. And we have time for everything but God. Say amen when I'm preaching good. So we have to look at the pattern of our life. That determines how close we often feel to him and how distant he can feel. So I have to realize, you know, if I make time for God occasionally, I'm probably going to sense him occasionally. But if I give him first place in my life, I will walk in that presence. I will know that I know that I know. And nobody can take that away from me because God gave it to me and the other person didn't, and they can't take away what God gave to me. So if I have the same affections towards the world that I do towards God, I would consider myself worldly. You see what I'm saying? So that's another reason. Pride, I don't need God. I'm not weak that I have to have a crutch. Or worldly, the things of the world are just as important or more important than God. And come on, that describes the church today. Fast food Christianity once a month whether you need it or not. You know, come on, come on for an hour for a little quickie and everything will work out. That's not the kind of God that he is. He says, don't have other things before me. I'm just telling you the word. The next one that when, when, you, when he can seem far away is when there's rebellion. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 5 says this. Why should you be stricken again? You will just revolt more and more. The, your whole head is sick, and the whole heart faints. And look at verse 15 with me as well. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Now, he's talking about when there's just outright rebellion. The, the, these say, I don't want to hear anything negative. I know that's a problem. We don't want the whole truth. We want the gooey candy truth but we got to have the whole truth so we can enjoy. The only reason I enjoy light is because I recognize darkness. The only reason I know what's good is because I recognize what's bad. You see what I'm saying? So there are times when I'm rebellious. Now, when it says, you got to understand, we're, on, we're in the new covenant and Jesus is in our hearts and in our lives. And so he's right there and he's never leaving us nor forsaking us. That promise is still there. But there are times when he feels distance when I rebel. And what is rebellion? I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do this. And I don't care what Christianity says, I'm going to be this. And if I want to be bitter and I want to cuss them out, I'll do what I want to do. That's rebellion. And he's just basically saying, I'm here, but you can ask me to bless that rebellion and to be with you in that. I'm with you in that sense, but not in the sense that you really want me to be with you. I'm going to just stand here and watch you make a fool of yourself, and I'm here to help you pick the pieces up. I'm not going to condemn you. But that ain't going to work, and we're not going to partner together in the way we could partner together if you choose to rebel and think your way is better than mine. You're hearing what we're saying. So rebelliousness can also be a reason. Here's another one, and this is the last one. I could go on and on, but there's reasons that God seems far away even when he's not. This is another one that says we, he seems far away when we harbor sin in our hearts. Harbor, that means we kind of camp out in there. We, we put down a stake and we say, I'm going to stay here in this situation. You know, James chapter 3 and chapter 2 says, we all stumble in many ways. How many of you know we all stumble and mess up? There ain't a perfect person in here. 
We all mess up. We stumble in many things. If anyone doesn't stumble, especially in his word, he's a perfect man. The main way we stumble is in our mouth. That's what it's saying here. So we all, if you don't stumble in other ways, oh, oh you might just, you know, you, 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 we always used to say, we don't smoke and we don't chew and we don't date the girls who do, you know. We were proud of our holy ways in the days. Well, that's fine, but we ran our mouths about everybody and gossiped about everybody and ate so much that we weighed, 10, you know, 500, 600 pounds. But that was not, that was holy. Did any of you come from that background? Some of you don't understand what I'm talking about. But everybody thinks you can say anything, and everybody overlooks that. The Lord doesn't overlook it. Have you ever been in a loving, beautiful atmosphere, and somebody said something that was just ungodly or, or hurt somebody's feelings, and the whole atmosphere changed just with somebody's word? And it just a holy, and it wasn't a holy, but a hush went over the whole crowd because it just was spoken out of line. So words are very, very important. Psalm 66 and verse 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, I know it's there and I don't give a flip. I'm going to keep it there. The Lord will not hear. Is he with me? Yes, he's with me. But he's not going to just run to my rescue to, to, to meet all my other needs when I harbor that sin and I keep it there. It, it, it just doesn't work that way. Are you with me? The minute I say help, God's right there. He's not judging me. He's not condemning me. But as long as I think I can keep that sin, and I know what it is, and I don't care, I have a distance that I'm going to feel. Okay, are y'all understanding what I'm talking about? He is there, but you cannot do what you want to do and sense the glory of God all the time. It just doesn't work that way. Come on. God is holy, and we are to be holy as he is. I'm going to close out just because of our time here, let me just say this. There was a time in our family, I basically was a single dad with my kids. And there was a time that Angela was the only one that was really with me in the household. And Angela decided, she's not here to defend herself, but everybody will vouch this was true. She just went crazy one time. Your kids ever just have the spirit of crazy come on them every now and then? They're your kids, and you love them, and you'll never forsake them just like God. But every now, there's a spirit of stupid or just dumb decisions that come on them, and you go, whose kid are you? I taught you better than that, and it's just like they came from another family and moved in, and that's the same body and the same, same voice, but you sure aren't living the way you know you're supposed to live. And it was one of those situations that Angela just kind of went through. And, man, it broke my heart because we'd been through so much together. I had poured things into her that, because she had extra needs. How many of you know that middle child syndrome, that the, the middle child, you know, it, they, they have special needs. And I'd poured things into her, and, and it was tough. How many middle children are, are in this house? Hold you. All right. We're going to have special prayer for you at the end of the service. I understand. But it was a tough time. And honestly, the Lord was speaking to me, and it was one of the most difficult times that I'd ever, ever experienced with her. But I had to let her feel the weight of her own bad choices. And that's the most painful thing because you don't want to even acknowledge them. You want to get her out of it. But I couldn't. I loved her. Listen to this. I loved her unconditionally and always would, no matter what she did. Did I leave her? No, I didn't leave her. Never would leave her. But did I bless her? She was blessed. She had a lot of blessing that I wanted to give her, but I was not going to release my blessing to her as long as she was making those choices. What do I mean by blessings? I mean, I stopped paying the car payment. I'm not paying the car payment to go out and do the stuff she was doing. It's over. I wasn't going to... All right, I don't need to make a list. You understand what I'm talking about. I loved her. She had my telephone. Anytime she needed me, I was right there. But I wasn't going to support that kind of lifestyle at that particular. I just wasn't going to do it. I'm not blessing it. You have my love. You have my presence anytime you need it. But you don't have my blessing. And as of right now, you don't have my money. That was hard. In fact, I had people in the church. Now, pastor, come on. You need, and they'd slip her a little bit of money. And actually, well, I won't even go into that. I love the people they meant well, but they've spoiled all their kids rotten. You ain't going to spoil mine rotten. 
We're going to go through something. And in the end, we're going we're to see the result. I, ho- I was hoping and praying. I didn't know what kind of result. But you got to do what God tells you to do. And we didn't come this far to just look religious. We wanted to be the real deal. And it was hard, and it, it, it was tearful, and it was, it was terrible. But I got a telephone call one day after standing my ground, and they'll test you. You say that you'll do it, but if you don't do it, they'll never believe you'll do it. It's hard. She called me. She said, Daddy, can I come home? And I knew what that meant. I knew prayers were being answered. And I said, of course you can come home. What's going on? Well, I'm over here. I'll tell you, I just can't take it anymore. I'm wrong. I know I need to come home. And I need to get right with you and the family. And, and, and I just need to, I need to change. I said, of course you can. I'll come get you where you're at. I did. And we talked and we prayed and embraced. And I, I reminded the story of the prodigal because the prodigal had to come to himself. The father was waiting with open arms. In fact, he was looking because he saw him a, far, a long way off when he was coming before he even got to the door. He ran out to meet him <laughs> because the father never is condemning He's always ready to receive and restore in love. We had a family meeting because it wasn't just a hurt for me. We're in ministry. We stand for God. And and so when all these things happen, it hurt all of us. And I I talked to her about, I said, sweetheart, I love you and I I receive you and I forgive you. But you, you, you owe the whole family that. Let's all talk. Let's get, let's get real because there's moments in my life where I messed up and I had to apologize to them and I had to be real to them. And now you've messed up. Now you're going to have to do the same thing that you saw your daddy do. We're either going to live this stuff or we're not. And so the whole family got together and there was tears and, <laughs> and it was a very emotional time. But she asked them to forgive her and they did. And we prayed and we talked. And ever since that moment, she's been a different person. God brought a godly man into her life, and they now pastor a church sent out by us in Rockwall, Texas. And I'm so grateful for that. So grateful for that. I use that as an example of God never leaving us and never forsaking us. We might leave him, but he'll never leave you. And there are times that he's silent, and there's times where he's right there ready to come to your rescue. I love that song we sing, I cried, you answered, and came to my rescue, and I want to be where you are. I love that. It's a cry of my heart. Because anytime we cry, he's right there. A very present help in the time of trouble, and there's no qualifications for that. He's just there. He's just there. He doesn't say, well, you get, no, no, no. He's there. He loves you. He'll always be there. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. That's what grace is, undeserved, unearned. You do it bad, and God will still show up and put his arm around you. But if you walk away and you persist in that, he will love you and be there watching you, watching over you. But you won't have the blessings that he has in his heart to give you. He withholds them until you come to yourself and come back to him. And he pours out lavishly. So much so did the, did the father or the prodigal son pour his blessing out so lavishly that the elder brother that never left and never did anything wrong was in church every Sunday and every Wednesday night. He said, well, who does he think he is? And how many of you have ever felt the elder brother spirit when you've messed up royally, but all the church folks who their sin was hiding, nobody knew what they sinned, but your sin was outward and they looked at you and didn't feel you were worthy. I got in the face at somebody one time that said, you're not worthy to do and I said you know what I finally realized for the first time I'm not worth it you are so right this is the grace of Jesus and then they got madder than ever and walked away because they didn't they didn't think I deserved it and you know what they're right I don't deserve it and until you get that revelation you don't deserve anything it's all the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God you'll never be able to serve him you'll think that you deserve something here's the last scripture And this is my favorite part. I saved the best to last in Deuteronomy 31 and 6. This is what I want you to remember. Deuteronomy 31 and 6. This was second generation Israel. 
First generation didn't believe God was with him if they went into the promised land. So what did he say? They got to the promised land, and they were ready to go in. They sent in Joshua. They sent in Cable. They, spent, they sent in 12 spies, and those two were the only two that believed. And everybody else went with the others. They didn't believe that God would be with them. So he said, okay, 40 years for every day that they stayed in there and checked out the land and came back unbelieving, they had to travel 40 year, a, a year for every day that they spent in there not believing. That's why it was 40 years, because it was 40 days that they went in to check out the land. And guess what? That whole generation died off out in the wilderness. And now they're back, the second generation. These were the children of those that didn't get through. This was the, the promise that the parents should have received, but their children is receiving it now because they didn't believe God was with them. So here they are. They're, they're standing there, and basically... We find that Moses, this, these are his last words. They'd all, everybody died out in the wilderness except the children. And he's basically saying, guys, you're going to go in there, and there are going to be giants in that land. Think about it. God is strong, and God will be with you. Don't make the mistake your parents made. God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. These are the last words of Moses right before he died. Guys, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid and fear any of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave and he will not forsake you. That says it all, doesn't it? Stand up with me. Go ahead and stand. That says it all. Somebody is facing something and you feel, oh, will God be with me? I don't know if I, God said, I'll never, do not fear. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You can trust me. Come on, somebody I'm talking to, I just feel it today. Thank you, God. Whether it's your finances, it's your babies, your children, your grandchildren, your marriage, whatever it is. He's not walking. He's not going anywhere. All he wants you to do is to acknowledge him. Don't fear. Don't be afraid of those giants and those things out there. His love and his grace never fails. Never gives up. And he'll never walk out on you. If you're feeling maybe that you're alone and maybe you've recognized one of these traits of rebellion.